it is time for our final season two cut content from Mr. Any News. Give it to us. Season two wrapped things up rather nicely for us. There were very few questions that went unanswered by the credit roll. But th there is one question. <laughs> what the hell is Amelia gonna talk to Subaru at night? It seems like you're hinting at something bad's gonna happen and just conveniently ended a season without us telling us. What happened in season one content? The shit got cut out where it's just like, who's Rem, right? Clearly there is a disaster coming, but the anime, the original series, they decided, hey, hey, let's just like, uh, not ruin it, right? Let's end off on a high note rather than just like teasing the anime only with the disaster. The same can't be said for the ending in the novels. Setting aside the whole cliffhanger ending they decided not to include, there was also quite a few- Bruh. Ryuzu's outfit. Echidna's face. When Ryuzu Bilma talked with Echidna's voice actor. And this now? <laughs> I mean, hello? To include, there was also quite a few missing details that would have left us with even more questions. Stuff relating to the Echidna from the tomb and even the involvement of an unknown third party with the assassin organization. What? So let's finish up season two of cut content for ReZero and yes, take a sir. look at everything the finale didn't include from the novels. But Let's first, begin. but first, episode 50, no ad. Offbeat Steps Under the Moonlight, covering the last two chapters of volume 15 of the light novel. Starting things off moments after the fight began, we learned that Elminia was only a fraction of the true potential dark magic has to offer. That's right, it's not even Alminia, it's not even Olminia, right? Al, I think, is the strongest variant, the prefix you add. Plus, Biko is limited. Right? She says like, oh, but the contractor of this caliber. Subaru though is, has great affinity with, with spirits though. And he also uses shadow elements. So I wonder if Biko is just being very tsundere about this or... I don't know what, like how well these two are compatible, but I, it looks very compatible to me. ...fraction of the true potential dark magic has to offer. It apparently provides the greatest magical power out of any other element in the world. Got fucking baited in, the, in like arc 2 when Subaru was being taught Shamak. And Puck was like, yeah, this shit's kind of useless. Dark element? Yeah, it's just debuffs. That's about it. And the Beak was like, nah, look at this. There's like offensive capabilities if you crystallize. So Beatrice was going to showcase every bit of mastery her mother had taught her. Not only that, but because Subaru was now a spirit mage himself, yep. he too could take part in the casting of dark magic as well. I think this is only possible when he's in contact with Biko though, because his gate is broken. And if he's not touching Biko, then I'm gonna assume that he can't just fucking spam Minya, right? Tape has a great... Tape does a great job of introducing new powers while making sure it's pretty balanced. Return by Dust from the beginning was incredibly seemingly OP, but you quickly realize it's not. It's suffering, people are suspicious when you know extra details, and on top of that, Miasma stacks, and if people can smell it like Garfield, right, it's, it's bad. In this one, I feel like if we're in contact with Biko, shit will be so easy. But I guarantee you in season 3, you know what they're gonna do. This motherfucker will be separated from Biko, right? I highly doubt that the author will create a scenario where like Subaru and Biko will always be together. There's gonna be some bullshit that separates them and Subaru won't have this fucking dark power. Like 100% they'll do that. This show does that all the time. Another thing, Reinhardt, motherfucker shows up for two episodes in the beginning, episode two and three, and I'm like, oh my god, Reinhardt's here. We can trust him. Nah, he's gone for the rest of the fucking season, even though he shows up for a bit, but he hasn't really helped out in terms of combat, right? And, and, and like other powerful people like Puck and Roswell, there's like plot-related reasons why they're removed to make sure you don't just bulldoze through your opponents. And this, bro, I guarantee you, this is probably one of the rarest times we're ever going to see Biko and, you know, Subaru together and Subaru using dark magic like that. Because if you just allowed him to just go off like this, where's the struggle, right? Where's the struggle and where's the challenges? You see, a contracted spirit makes it so that the spirit mage no longer needs to rely on the mana within themselves. And <laughs> what is this guy? <laughs> I clipped you several times calling viewers the R word. Yes. Yes. You are a retard. There's a lot of retards online. Like, do you think that, like, you got me? Who are you going to tell? Mr. YouTube? You're going to phone up Mr. YouTube? Hey! This person's being mad! And inflicting copyright. What does that even mean? So I have kick.
<laughs> we got a schizo dude coming in here thinking, oh, I'm the police. I have reported you to Mr. Twitch. People like you are just the bane of content creation. But at the same time, this is the best part. The best part is that I no longer am bound by, let's say, being shit on by the public in a client facing job, right? You work a retail job, you work a cashier job, anything that's client facing, they will shit on you. And then what happens? Well, what happens is you can't say anything back because you got to keep your job. But here's the best part about what I'm doing now. I can dunk on you. I can roast you. And then I can make money off of that. And my audience loves that shit too. So <laughs> just enjoy. <laughs> Goodbye. Oh no! Mr. Twitch go get me, bro! Oh no! Inflicting copyright! Oh shit! It's over, guys! Okay, let's get back to this. Instead, they become able to manipulate the mana within the air. That's why Subaru could influence the world around him even while having this broken gate. As for the mental image he came go up back, with- Go back, go back, go back! Mother had taught her. Not only that, but because Subaru was now a spirit mage himself, yeah. he too could take part in the casting of dark magic as well. You see, a contracted spirit makes it so that the spirit mage no longer needs to rely on the mana within themselves. That's right, it's external source of mana now. But the gate is broken, but we're using Biko's gate. Instead, they become able to manipulate the mana within the air. That's why Subaru could influence the world around him even while having this broken gate. As for the mental image he came up with to help him do that, well, he pretty much imagined- But he doesn't really like- I wonder, like, like it, does the physical contact with Biko needs to be met for the gate to work? Because like, like, again, we're borrowing Biko's gate. Biko could influence the world around him even while having this broken gate. As for the mental image he came up with to help him do that, well, he pretty much imagined that he was loading a gun. He'd visualize himself Renful creating Gola. these bullets of mana then pull the trigger. Beatrice, on the other hand, didn't limit herself to only that. She was instead using many different variations of all the spells in her arsenal. Okay. Almost as if she was trying to showcase everything she was capable of to Subaru. I mean, shit, all I saw was a bunch of purple crystals <laughs> airing down, so it just looked like it's just one purple crystal move, Minya. Now, once Subaru and Beatrice had come up with their plan to win, a large part of it was out of consideration for Amelia. Because the biggest issue right now was finding the power to wipe out the rabbits all at once, Subaru knew that Amelia was thinking of sacrificing herself. It was pretty obvious that she was considering using a power she'd only ever used once before. One that would have ended with her becoming another statue of ice. Since this was a situation that Subaru wanted to avoid, he went on to tell Amelia to be a little more selfish. He didn't want her to continue to think that it was okay to hurt herself so long as everyone else was saved. Okay. So Subaru made sure to come up with a plan that completely avoided that. A plan that would culminate with the casting of a spell known as Kokitis. Kokitis! Guys, one second. Let me just do this real quick, alright? Refresh your streams, alright? Refresh your streams! One second, one second, one second, one second. And now, all right, we're back. We're good, right? Yeah, we're back, we're back, we're back. Just wanted to refresh cash. We're good, we're good, we're good. One moment. All right. Uh, here we go. Okay, Cocutus. We're on Cocutus right now. Come up with a plan that completely avoided that. A plan that would culminate with the casting of a spell known as Cocytus. As the icy prison began to float its way into the sky. How did Subaru outrun the bunnies? The 
unreasonable thing the 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 thing that didn't really make sense but i'm like i don't really care at this point like come on like we're sending this bunny through a separate dimension is that subaru outran the bunnies and they're somehow all contained here it, it, it's just kind of impressive that like all the bunnies were just huddled in and he somehow just created a border like that and he outran them i guess he just built different bro Subaru felt the need to hurl one last insult all while flipping them off in the process, <laughs> bringing us now to the final moments of the battle. Okay. If you're wondering why the rabbits began to eat themselves here, well, that's because Al Shamak had deprived their senses of that's any right. potential prey. They didn't know what they're eating. By removing their ability to determine where the closest source of mana was, it made it so that hunger was no longer their most overwhelming sensation. Instead, the only thing the rabbits now felt was disappointment and despair. So, with no clear goal in sight, the rabbits were left with no choice but to consume whatever was closest to it. That was the only way it could attempt to satisfy its single desire. In the end, all that was left was an endless loop of hunger, despair, and rebirth. <gasps> there was no limit to the cravings it felt it needed to satisfy. But as this hellish cycle continued, there was a slight moment where the demon beast itself began to wonder if this was how their mother felt. Hmm. It was a single instance of reason that manifested itself into one momentary thought. A short-lived perception of itself and its mother that ended up quickly being overshadowed by the madness of gluttony. Anyway, what the And that's it, huh? Like, the bunnies are just gone. They've been sent to a separate dimension, and now, it's like, that's it. But, like, they're not subject- they're, they're not killed, like, executed, finished, like the white whale, right? They're, they're, they're just in a different dimension now, forever just repeat reproducing and eating themselves. So, I can't really say that they're gone forever, but for now, it's just gone. For now, it's gone, but there's a potential of it coming back somehow. I'm not sure how it would. ...perception of itself and its mother that ended up quickly being overshadowed by the madness of gluttony. Anyway, with the rabbits having been defeated by the greatest of spells in the Shamok variant, we can now move on to the moments in the tomb. And the different dimension part is not Al Shamak, right? Al Shamak is this AoE debuff, blind, confusion, I don't know, whatever. Bunnies don't know, they're deprived of all senses. But this is like a very, this is like door passage. And door passage is not specifically shadow element magic, right? Like, like this is, I don't know what this is. They never really explain how door passage, what kind of element affinity and how it's done, but... All right, we'll use Al Shamak, then we port them out of here. ...by the greatest of spells in the Shamak favor. It seems like Al Shamak did this, right? Because she says Al Shamak, and then the bunnies get blinded, but I don't... I don't think we can completely confirm that, like, this portal is... You know... I'm not sure this is also Shamak. Is it? Is it really Al Shamak? Because if Al Shamak is literally depriving senses and then also, like, <laughs> dimensional travel, like, that's kind of crazy. Right? That's kind of insane. We can now move on to the moments in the tomb. One thing to note about Roswell here was that he wasn't wearing his typical jester's outfit. Instead, he wore clothing similar to what he had back when he lived in Sanctuary. Hmm. He didn't even have any of his makeup on. Less like so Hector. that's why Beatrice had made the comment about him acting rather different. Now, after Roswell revealed that he'd been transferring his soul over to the bodies of his kin, Beatrice realized it had been staring her right in the face the entire time. Yeah, I didn't realize that Biku didn't know. I thought Biku just felt like Roswell, the one that she knew, Roswell A. Mathers, was slowly disappearing away, and that's why the Roswell L. Mathers is someone that's pretty much unknown to her, but she just straight up never knew that Roswell has been sending himself down his descendants. The single blue eye from his original form was the one thing passed down from body to body. This, however, wasn't Beatrice's reason for hitting him. It wasn't her right to punish him for having stolen the bodies of his children. That right belonged solely to the children themselves. Yeah, I don't think they really have. <laughs> what are they gonna do? They, they can't fucking voice their opinions. They, they have no consent in it. Rosal does whatever he wants. Those poor kids, man. So it was for this very reason that Beatrice decided to dismiss it. Oh, I want some kind of fucked up like side story of like how Roswell has been like, transcending his mortal flesh. Like, at what age does he tell the kid, like, alright, kid. You know, it's like, hey, daddy, wow, I love you so much. Alright, kid, you've turned, like, what? What's, what's, like, a suitable age when Roswell picks him, you know? At what point does he decide to just, like, take him to the back of the shed? Like, 
<laughs> I don't know. Instead, only blaming him for burning down the library. As Roswell was about to explain his involvement with everything else, Beatrice figured it was probably best not to hear it. She felt that if Roswell was to identify all the schemes he'd been a part of, then it was likely she wouldn't have been able to forgive him at all. So, for the sake of the truce with Subaru, Beatrice simply didn't allow him to talk about it. Now, if you're wondering why the witch in the- This face is so stupid. <laughs> why does it look like this? Why? I don't understand, bro. Like, how? Why? tomb looked so different from the witch in the dream world. Cause she's older? Well, that was something first explained when Amelia saw her. The way she described it was that the woman in the tomb was only reminiscent of the witch she'd come to know personally. Yeah, cause it's older body? There was this body? very clear difference in age between the two of them. Whereas the echidna from the trials looked to be in the latter half of her teenage years, this person looked to be at least in her mid-twenties. If anything, she could probably pass as a relative or sibling. But she certainly wasn't the same echidna she'd met before. At least not to her, anyway. Moving on to Ross. Like her nose! It's a fucking Moyai emote! What, what, what the hell is happening, bro? Like, why? It looks so awkward. Like, it's, it's such a memeable thing. When I first saw this, I was like, are they serious right now? <laughs> it's, 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 it, she just looks so goofy here, but older body, that's why. Moving on to Roswell's trial in the cathedral. It turns out that Subaru never actually got to clearing up the whole baby incident. The way Amelia seemed so earnest in the way she was approaching it, made dispelling the whole misconception something that needed to be done later. It wasn't something Subaru felt he could briefly explain. So he decided to leave it be until everything else was sorted out. As for this makeshift conference slash punishment, Patadash and Frederica made sure to get their hits in as well. That's a crazy Frederica used her transformed fist to give him quite the punch. And the land dragon charged into him much like how she did to Garfield. Man, we needed the Patrashin against Gar Roswell. Everyone got a hit in. So everyone got their turn when it came okay, to- That was the best one. I, I think of all the ones, Petra's was probably the best. Petra because obviously she's just a little kid and there's something funny about a little kid just slapping the shit out of his- And it's, his, it's her employer, right? Literally boss. It's her boss and she slapped the shit out of him. And then on top of that, she says, I still don't trust your ass. She's like, other people may forgive you? Uh-uh, not me. But their turn when it came to giving Roswell his punishment. Now, when Roswell went on to talk about his oath sealed by a curse, there was an additional element to it that made it a bit more serious. Hmm. Getting reduced to ashes wasn't the only punishment for breaking it. And that's because an oath like this was tied to the very person's soul. What this meant was that if Subaru or Roswell had lost the bet and didn't follow through with what they promised, then their soul would have literally fallen into the void. Yeah, and then if we lost our bet, it would have gone to Subaru. Likely making it impossible for either to come back again. Anyway. And again, soul damage means that you're actually dead. Just like in the witch party, if you died in the witch party, return by death doesn't work anymore. Return by death... Like, like, if there's no soul, how do you return by death, right? After Roswell made his new oath and got called a piece of shit a couple more times, <laughs> there was an entire- Wait, <laughs> by Petra? Let's see. That's right, Petra's a good girl, and you're shit. <laughs> Let's go, Petra! A couple more times. There was an entire scene with just Beatrice and Subaru after that didn't make it into the anime. Subaru was currently in the deepest parts of the tomb thinking everything over. He was sitting next to the coffin of the witch it belonged to. While that did give Beatrice strange ideas as to what Subaru could be up to, she told him she would keep secret whatever unspeakable hobbies he was into. An obvious misunderstanding on her part, but definitely a sign of their new level of intimacy. Unspeakable hobby. There was now this clear feeling of affection between the two of them. In any case, Beatrice then went on to identify the woman in the coffin. Though she- I don't know what that meant. Is that- are we talking about Lollicon shit? Are we- are we talking about Lollicon shit right now? As to what Subaru could be up to. She told him she would keep secret whatever unspeakable hobbies he was into. What hobbies are you talking about? An obvious misunderstanding on her part. Okay. But definitely a sign of their- We actually talking about necro shit? Ew. Ew. New level of intimacy. There was now- Is he actually into it? Or are we just talking off of that echidna bot? Are, are, are we just talking off of this scene? And then memeing around that a super who actually into it? Super could be up to. She Aww. told him she would keep secret whatever unspeakable hobbies he was into. Okay. An obvious misunderstanding on her part, but definitely a sign of their new level of intimacy. 
There was now this clear feeling of affection between the two of them. Hmm. In any case, Beatrice then went on to identify the woman in the coffin, though she stated her name to be Echidna. She also confirmed that this wasn't the same Witch of Greed that he was familiar with. It made Subaru think that perhaps there were two different Echidnas. But unfortunately, that wasn't something Beatrice could either confirm or deny. We're not doing this shit right now, are we? Are you serious? <sighs> There's two Echidnas, maybe? I mean, now with shit like this happening, right? The, the, the logical level one way of thinking is she, her body got older. Her body got older, right? The nose kept growing. That's it, bro. That's it. But it's like, hold up. Oh, there's actually two echidnas, bro. As the two continued to talk, the topic of conversation shifted over to Shima's sacrifice. And think about it. <laughs> one, of the, one of the Ryuzus literally talked in echidna's voice. So, now the schizo theory is, Echidna actually did succeed with their immortality experiment. It was hinted, <laughs> with the other Ryuzu. And the other body is some sort of fucking, I don't know, I don't have an answer for the core, but... We, there, there can be a lot of schizo theories with this now. Sacrifice. Specifically her disappearance along with the original Ryuzu and the crystal that sealed her. Hmm. While her sacrifice was an unavoidable step in freeing Sanctuary. And, but, but this is the one that talked in Echidna's voice, right? Shima is the one that talked in Echidna's voice just for one line. And then Shima and the crystal disappeared, right? Is Echidna now freed and she's like roaming around? I don't know. I, I, cause like, cause like this Shima and the crystal disappearing, sure. We're supposed to believe that they have now sacrificed themselves and, uh, you know, barrier gone. But... What if there's more to it now? Subaru believed her choice to do so was all for the sake of Garfield. Ah, so shit. he felt it was necessary to live up to the standards she laid out for them. Now, it's after all this that the most important part of their conversation begins. There was quite a few things that Beatrice felt Subaru needed to know about being a spirit mage. Okay. Especially since it was a byproduct of his accomplishments that he wasn't even expecting. First was that Beatrice was no regular spirit. She great wasn't spirit. a lesser spirit, greater spirit, or even quasi-spirit. No, great. as a spirit manually- I, I didn't even know a quasi-spirit is a thing, and I didn't think that a greater spirit is- What? <laughs> there's, there's lesser, great, and then greater? I didn't know there's a differentiation between great and greater. I thought that there were basically great spirits, and then there's also a category of the four great spirits, which is like, acknowledged by the world. But, greater? Or even quasi-spirit. Quasi? Is it quasi because there's multiple- I, I thought these are just multiple lesser spirits, but there's quasi spirits. No. As a spirit manually created from the actions of a witch, Beatrice was what's known as an artificial spirit. Okay. I still don't know how spirits are really created. I, I have no clue how spirits are created, but there's organic ways of creating it, and Bieko is an artificial one. While this did mean that she had certain special powers, it also meant that she had certain flaws as well. Such as? The most prominent being that she monopolizes the person she makes a contract with. Monopolize? This wasn't because she wanted- As in like, be me, if, sorry, uh, like, I need to be your number one, you know, think about only about Betty, Betty, Betty. Subaru all to herself though. It was more so because the cost of keeping her as a spirit was simply just that high. Any spirit mage contracted with Beatrice would find their entire capacity filled up by only her. Okay. So that and s a spirit capacity, I didn't even know that was like a fucking thing. So there's potential to main like have multiple contract with different spirits, but Subaru is now maining only Biko. So that meant it was now impossible for Subaru to make contracts with any other spirit. No, Aya. As for her next flaw, well, that relates more to her capacity for mana. As it turns out, the frightening display of magic she'd put on while facing the rabbits was really only a one-time occurrence. Okay. Apparently, it required every bit of mana she'd been storing over the past few centuries. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about, bro. But not only have I already explained to you how bullshit this is and how in Season 3, Biko and, Puck will be, Biko and Subaru will be separated, but on top of that, this is like a one-time thing. This cannot be done over again. <laughs> what a fucking fraud. That's- that's the thing- I- I mean, we've seen over and over, right? Tape has a very good job balancing these powers, but this is very frustrating. It's, it's just so fucking frustrating. And that was mana she only happened to obtain by stealing it in little amounts from people in the mansion. 
<laughs> She's stealing pop mana from the mansion? So, what we saw here was essentially 400 years worth of mana coming to the surface. Wait, did we already watch the last episode? You are the specific tourist I'm talking about that thinks like you only show up during just re-zero reactions and your monkey brains has realized that, huh, this guy seems to watch it around like, you know, the last video for the stream. And last night I was like, oh, I cannot wait for these tourists to realize that I've already watched it. It's on you. Yep. Yep. For two fucking months straight, you only show up to the stream just for Reezer at the end. You figure out a pattern of behavior as an intelligent monkey should. And sure, that's fair, right? That's fair. But last night, I was like, <laughs> nah, fuck you. You don't deserve this content. You're a tourist. Get out of here. This resulting in a complete depletion of her reserves all the way down to zero. What this meant was that Superu would now have to use his own personal mana just to keep Beatrice corporeal leaving nothing left for any sort of magic whatsoever. So, the two of them were now this duo of spirit and spirit mage currently incapable of casting magic. Like- <sighs> They're useless. We're, she's literal of baggage, like- Like, like- What's the point? What's the actual point? We're going to a war and she- And the best part is the anime onlys, bro. Anime only have no idea what's gonna happen to them. Cause they remember in the back of their mind season two Biko hailing down purple crystals and fucking dimensional seal. It's like damn Biko OP. Yo, we going to a war? Yo, Biko gonna dominate. No. No. We have another liability. The two of them were now this duo of spirit and spirit mage currently incapable of casting magic. Jesus Likely Christ. Likely the first ever of its kind. Jesus Christ, we're literally the worst duo ever. We're literally the worst. Oh my. What do we do about this? Can Roswell give us his mana? Can Amelia give us. <laughs> I don't know. Well, new set of problems for next season, which is tomorrow. Now, moving on to the ceremony of Subaru's knighthood. There were quite a few additional reasons for it aside from Roswell just following through with the promise. Not only did this qualify Subaru to stand by Amelia's side, but it also formalized the merit of all his accomplishments. You see, by becoming a knight, the news of him defeating the White Whale and an Archbishop of Sin would reach yes. even the neighboring kingdom. That's the thing I'm talking about. Most people watching ReZero have no clue what the perfect timeline looks to other people. Within, again, as soon as he fucked up at the Royal Capital, he then subjugated the White Whale within a week into an Archbishop Betrigus, which is one of the most popular and well-known ones, into the White Rabbit within, like, a matter of weeks. Like, like neighboring kingdoms are going to hear about this shit and be like, what the hell? There is this new threat. Maybe people are thinking Lugunica has somehow received Jesus Christ just performing miracles. Also, here it is. Here's the map. This is where Satala is sealed. Agria Sand Dunes. East of Lugunica, the desert. Interesting that this says Pleiades Watchtower. I feel like this map has a lot of spoilers, but it's kind of like out of context spoilers, which I don't mind because Pleiades, we know, Subaru, Pleiades, constellations. This is where Satala, or the Witch of Envy, should I say, is quote unquote sealed, the desert area. Um, Elior Forest is almost near Gusteco. Uninhabited land, that's interesting. Uninhabited land north of Gusteco. And then obviously around all the edges, we have the Great Waterfall. And the beings, you know, beyond the Great Waterfalls, they refer to as Isekai characters because to them it's like another world or to them. Kararagi, Volakian. And I hear like this is where season three is going to happen, right? The neighboring border of Kararagi and Lugunica, one of the like biggest cities, one of the, I think Lugunica has like, I forget how many big cities there are. But this is one of them, right? Priestella. Sounds like Priscilla. But I, I hear that this is where Season 3 is pretty much going to happen. Or at least Arc 5 will. So, part of this was to gather a lot of foreign and domestic interest in Amelia's candidacy. That's why such an extravagant ceremony was needed. <laughs> a weekend at the Bernies. <laughs> I just love how Rem is... Rem has to literally hold a Rem up. And her it's just... It's just Something about this is hilarious to me. Garfield's constantly... He's just annoyed at this, you know, uh, formal attire. And a lot of people are hyping up this guy with the monocle here, right? The blue hairy guy. This dude, I think, is going to be important for the future. 
as the topic of conversation shifted over to Anne. Subaru couldn't help but feel Anderose. a bit jealous over how- Is Anderose basically mad that Biko and Petra, who are also lollies, are, you know, blocking the view of Amelia? Because Anderose is like the biggest Amelia simp I hear. Close she was with Amelia. Yes, she was only nine years old. Nine. But it did make sense that she would get along with Amelia since the two were pretty much the same age mentally. That's so embarrassing. <laughs> Fucking toddler ass mentality. In fact, she was probably even more mature than Amelia was. What? There was, however, one thing that Subaru actually didn't like about her. And that was the fact that she was the one who planted the absurd idea of how babies were made. Oh, and that was the one that told her? It's just okay. In any case, it turns out that Roswell had planned for this private conversation to happen. He even went so far as to put up some sort of people-repelling barrier. Oh, okay. That way the two could talk about Echidna without having to worry about being overheard or disturbed. The first thing Roswell mentioned was that Echidna didn't have any siblings or relatives, basically confirming the existence of a single Witch of Greed. Okay, so now we can just ignore the shit that happened back here with, you know, Echidna's face being weird and then potentially double Echidna exist. Well, you can still say it's a clone or some shit, I don't know, man. They're, 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 they're doing some weird ass shit here with Echidna, man, but okay, she's a, she's a, she's, She's got no parents? No nothing? Roswell mentioned was that Echidna didn't have any siblings or relatives. Okay, siblings or relatives, who knows who her parents is, but only child. Basically confirming the existence of a single Witch of Greed. What this meant for Subaru was that the Echidna he met in the dream world was someone else. What do you mean? This is still the single Witch of Greed that died and is now soulless in here. What do you, what do you mean by that? I mean, with both Beatrice and Roswell saying the exact same thing, there was no way he could deny that the witch he'd met was different. Wait, what are you talking about? I don't understand that l logical jump. Like, like, everything made sense so far. Roswell said Echidna has no siblings or relatives. Okay. And suddenly that is confirmation that the Echidna we saw at the tea party is not... The Echidna... What? what, what? It was a revelation that just went to make everything that happened to him all the more confusing. What? That said, the witches he met were undeniably real. What are you talking about? How? When did Echidna ever mention that she has siblings or relatives? If we're going to use that one single confirmation from Roswell as, you know, proof that there's two separate Echidnas, then how does that make any sense? How? Disturbed. The first thing Roswell mentioned was that Echidna didn't have any siblings or relatives. That's totally fine. So what? How does this suddenly prove or disprove anything? Why would that matter? Basically confirming the existence of a single Witch of Greed. Okay, so what? Everything is still consistent, and that single Witch of Greed is the one that we saw at the tea party, so what? What this meant for Subaru was that the Echidna he met in the dream world was someone else. What do you mean it's someone else? It's clearly 19-year-old Echidna that died and is in this 19-year-old form. But the body that we saw outside, which is the corpse, is the older Echidna that had her nose get bigger. I don't understand the logic here. I feel like I'm listening so attentively, and suddenly there's this insane jump in logic just because <laughs> Roswell says no siblings, no relatives? What? I mean, with both Beatrice and Roswell saying the exact same thing, there was no way he could deny that the witch he'd met was different. How does that make any fucking sense? Like, how? It, I, and sometimes, I don't understand if Annie News is also speaking on behalf of Subaru's assumptions, and not like, this is a fact. It was a revelation that just went to make everything that happened to him all the more confusing. I could say the same shit. What you just told me is making this so fucking confusing. That said, the witches he met were undeniably real. There was just no way to confirm whether the one who called herself Greed was an imposter or not. How could you know that? Based off of Roswell saying no siblings and- Again, how the hell does no siblings or relatives suddenly make you think this? That makes no fucking sense, unless a kid that specifically mentioned something about that in the past. In any case, Resurrecting the real Echidna remained Roswell's objective. There may not currently be any known method for bringing her back to life, but- Even 
if it's assumptions, not confirmations, how does that assumption map? Like, if you're going to assume something, there needs to be a basis, a foundation of logic. It, it doesn't matter if it's an assumption or confirmation. The logic makes no fucking sense. None of this shit makes sense. But the initial step of gathering her remains has already been completed. The next was now to have Amelia take the throne. So if you look at it in terms of common goals, then Subaru being Roswell's co-conspirator was something that really didn't change at all. In the end, Subaru had pretty much completed Roswell's objectives just like how he expected him to. Yeah. The only difference was the manner in which he did it. And that brings us to a very interesting line from the novels. You see, Roswell had mentioned something about how Subaru's loss should have made him become a sage. Haha! <laughs> but we are a sage candidate. A type of person who only wanted to protect the one most precious to him. That's what a sage is? I have no clue what a sage is, other than that there was a sage or a wise man, which is just kind of synonymous, right? I think sage is definitely the, the, the wisest man of all. Flugel, Flugel tree, right? Dragon sage, sword saint, seal, witch of envy. But a sage apparently only protects the one thing most precious to them. And this is a similar mentality that Roswell has shown us. That was apparently how Roswell was planning on saving him. Huh. Although the statement itself was very vague. It that's, that's interesting. You tell me that if you become a sage, you can only think like that? Did mark the second time that the title of sage had been mentioned in the same context Sage candidate. Sekhmet mentioned that Subaru is a sage candidate. The first being from the encounter with all the witches. So it's pretty obvious that Roswell- Who said the sage's name was Flugel though? You know what I hate about comments like you? It's that you- or like that one teacher. Like, it's a fucking school classroom and the teacher asks a question and someone confidently answers. And then the teacher, fully aware that this is the answer, but cannot back down and feels like they need their voices to be heard, will say, are you, are you sure about that? Are, are you really sure about that? Like, what are we doing here? Your dumbass has read a fucking head and you know goddamn well that the sage is flugal. But you're in here doing this shit. Are, are, are you sure about that? Shut the fuck up. Just watch. All of the witches seem to know something that Subaru doesn't. Regardless of what the true intent of these statements may be though, they really didn't matter anymore since this was a path that Subaru ultimately decided to reject. Instead, he was now following the path of the fool. A path that Roswell made sure to make clear he would never allow Subaru to compromise on. You see, if Subaru truly was going to save everyone without leaving a single person behind, then mm -hmm. Roswell was going to make sure that that's exactly what was going to happen. Okay. But Roswell also made a promise onto his oath, right? That he wouldn't sacrifice anyone in this room. Right? That, that's the thing. <laughs> I, I think the wording was very intentional. It's like, all right, how can we be sure that Roswell won't betray us? Well... Roswell then said, I will no longer put anyone in harm in this room to further my goals or something, right? But it, it doesn't mean that he can't kill anyone outside the room. I don't know. It's a sentiment that brings us to a line that was severely mistranslated in the anime. Yeah, I hear that the subs were fucked up all across the board, like, this is different. What Roswell said here wasn't supposed to be in a context- If you lost someone, I think? That referred to himself. If Instead, you... it was more like a vow he was making to Subaru. One that states if Subaru was to lose a single person he'd chosen to protect, yeah. then Roswell in response would proceed to kill everyone else. <laughs> Here we go. So like, Roswell is gonna be like... <laughs> it's basically every run is a speedrun of perfection. Just like a perfect speedrun, and as soon as one single thing goes wrong, yup, everything is gonna be dead. Yup, you're gonna restart this shit. It's gotta be a perfect speedrun. Thus forcing Subaru to have to restart. <laughs> <laughs> because Subaru was- Well, not basically like Puck, because like Puck will do that if Amelia dies at the end, right? Puck has one condition, but like, basically, Roswell is gonna summon Mahoraga. Roswell is just gonna fucking pull the just final fucking card immediately. Like, any single fucking, uh, just like accident or mistake, boom, instant reset. Was now the only person who could lead him to his goal. Roswell wasn't going to accept any sort of compromise regarding the path he chose to follow. Oh boy. From here on out, it was either going to be all of them or none of them. 
<laughs> like, I wonder what the 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 standards are, right? Because obviously, if a random villager dies, I don't think Roswell's gonna reset. Uh, but like, at what point does a character matter? Of course, the people in this room matter a lot, but like, I wonder how this is gonna happen. Like, if somehow like Romji died, oh, I'll be fucking, fl I'll be mad. But Romji is not that important to this group. Would Roswell be mad? Probably not. I don't know. This is gonna be funny to see in season three, though. Of them or none of them. There was no room for any more miscalculations in the way he does things. One wrong step and that would mean the death of everyone. Now, while that does sound a little bit threatening, it wasn't much of a problem so long as Subaru stayed true to who he was right now. It was just a little bit of extra pressure coming from the most powerful spellcaster in the world. Anyway, the final parts of their conversation came to reveal a hidden plan outside of the ones Roswell had made. As it turns out, Elsa was supposed to be the only assassin hired to take part in the contract at the mansion. Maybe. Not only that, but the contract itself was only supposed to target Beatrice. The Tome of Wisdom only mentioned liberating her, hmm. no one else. As we saw though, Elsa wasn't alone and her contract didn't target only Beatrice. Why is that? Did, is Elsa just abusing child labor and not letting Maidy in on the profits? What's going on? So, someone else had also planned for an attack on the mansion. And this is the other part, right? Beyond the assassination guild, how did Mady get involved in this? Someone that wasn't Roswell had hired the assassin organization as well. A clear indication that Subaru's troubles were only just beginning. <sighs> Wasn't just Roswell that hired it. But there's such extra info- And- If we assume that this group would hire Mady, and if we assume that Mady would then to just take out Petra and Frederica specifically? We can we can we can get on some go on some super crazy schizo theories now with how Petra's eyes are actually important and there's a group of people that's after Petra's eyes. Again, if the foundation of the assumption is this separate group hired Mady just to go after Petra's eyes, right? Just 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 to go after Petra and Frederica or something. Cause like I don't I don't know. I don't, this is this is crazy. It, this is crazy. In any case, the rest of the episode was pretty much the same. But there was one short addendum at the end of the novel leaving us on a pretty big cliffhanger. Okay. So if you don't want to know what that is, then feel free to click off the video now. Should we know this? Should we know this or what? Those troubles were only just beginning. In any case, the rest of the episode was pretty much the same. Okay. But there was one short addendum at the end of the novel leaving us on a pretty big cliffhanger. I, I feel like this is the thing that's going to be answered in the beginning of season 3. Even if a kidnapped version is better, why shouldn't I watch this and then watch a kidnapped version? Why does it matter? Like, the, 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 if, if the, the, the question is, can I watch the spoilers or not? And you motherfuckers are saying, I don't care about spoilers, go watch a kidnapped version. It means, you don't care about the spoilers. You just want me to watch the kidnapped version, meaning I can't watch this. What the fuck are you guys talking about? So, if you don't want to know what that is, then feel free to click off the We'll video watch both. Now. If you're good to hear it, then let's shift settings to one of absolute darkness. Okay. A place from which the only things to be heard were the insects crawling and water droplets falling. What? As that sound became dwarfed by the light footsteps of a girl with pink hair, a single comment Reason. was then made about the integrity of a reactivation ritual. What is a reactivation ritual? This has to do with the second echidna, maybe. Nothing else was said until after the girl had made her way out of the cave. Huh? When she did. Wait, 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 he, he just using Ryuzu's uh, model as a little girl. This is not actually Ryuzu. After the girl had made her way out of the cave. What cave? When she did. And, and, and this cave is not the witch's graveyard, right? This is just imagery that Anius is using. It has nothing to do with Ryuzu or the sanctuary. It's just we're in pitch dark and there's a girl is walking out of a cave. Droplets falling. As that sound became dwarfed by the light footsteps of a girl with pink hair. A single comment was then made about the integrity of a reactivation mm. ritual. Nothing else was said until after the girl had made her way out of the cave. Reactivation. When she did, this girl who was now gazing upon the real sun for the first time in what must have been centuries, found herself unamazed by what she thought was going to be a lot more magnificent. Huh? That said, she Centuries. This girl who was now gazing upon the real sun for the first time in what must have been centuries. Seal? Unsealed? Seal broken? Reactivation? Centuries? I don't think this is the Witch of Envy walking out after years and years, centuries of being sealed, but something else is happening here. 
found herself unamazed by what she thought was going to be a lot more magnificent. That said, she did find herself impressed by her own personal performance. performance the fact what? that her little trick had worked so well was something she couldn't help but compliment. Her little trick that somehow got her free from the cave? Though it was with the assistance of a thing she truly despised, there was no denying that it did play a crucial role in lifting the barrier and recovering the magic crystal. No, we're talking about- I think Echidna's out. I think Echidna's out, bro. Bro. Because, like, now suddenly, the thing, it sounds like- There was no denying Look at that it. it did play a crucial role in lifting the barrier and recovering the magic crystal. Now we're literally talking about the events of the sanctuary, lifting the barrier, and that thing is Amelia. Thing she couldn't help but compliment. What the fuck? Though it was with the assistance of a thing she truly despised. There was no denying that it did play a crucial role in lifting the barrier and recovering the magic crystal. Mm. So, even if this so-called vessel didn't end up getting crushed by the trial, its help was still necessary in getting this girl out of Sanctuary. Vessel? Are we still talking about Amelia as the vessel? Uh, was Echidna thinking about using Amelia's body? The vessel didn't end up getting crushed by the trial. I don't know, the way that Ennius is framing it and like making use of Amelia like this, it makes me, it makes me think that like Echidna wanted to use Amelia as like a vessel to repossess her body or some shit. Its help was still necessary in getting this girl out of Sanctuary. I'm thinking that Echidna is in Ryuzu uh, OG body right now. That's what I'm thinking is happening. And maybe the anime hinting at that of Ryuzu speaking with Echidna's voice acting, right? One line. Nobody talks about that shit. It, it sounded like Echidna is out and she's a lolly right now and Rosal has no clue. It was all a clever scheme that she alone had crafted. How the hell did she transcend Volcanica's seal? It sounds like Echidna has surpassed Volcanica Seal through some clever tricks it, that had to do with Amelia breaking, I, I don't know, but it, it sounded like Echidna is out. A plan that started ever since the one clone had broken the rules and stepped into the tomb. The day that she did, the witch who rested there had inserted a small portion of her soul into the clone's body, Okay. slowly but surely growing her presence and taking it over. This wasn't the same as bringing herself back to life, though. Revival by attaching a soul to another body was completely different from reviving the dead. This was much less elegant. Even so, the girl was happy to be able to- This is Echidna now, man. This is Echidna in Ryuzu body. Once again walk amongst the living. Ultimately naming herself Omega out of consideration Omega! for the current situation and certain- uh Able to once again walk amongst the living. Ultimately naming herself Omega out of consideration for the current situation and certain intentionally vague details. What is the implication of Omega? Let's see, let's ask ChatGPT. What are some implications of the term Omega in, I don't know, fantasy stories? I don't know, what is, what is, what's Omega, bro? Omega in fantasy stories can have a range of implications, blah, blah, blah. Ending and finality. As the last letter of the Greek alphabet, Omega. Okay, so it's the last letter. Often symbolizes the end or completion of a cycle. Yeah. Completion of a cycle. Yeah. Yeah, Echidna is back. Like this whole the reactivation thing. Transformation, redemption. Characters labeled as Omega may undergo significant transformation evolving from a perceived weakness to strength. Blah, blah, blah. Mystical and prophetic significance. Omega might also carry mystical prophetic weight, suggesting a character is destined for greatness and ultimate confrontation between good and evil, linking to the themes of fate and destiny. That's a bit extra. I, I think this is perfect right here. Something about the end and the fina finality, like completion of a cycle. And like, like, if we're supposed to now assume that Echidna has like, <laughs> like surpassed the volcanic steel and, and has attained a new vessel and implanted her soul in there, like, that's it, right? Like, that's it. This is new Echidna. And she has now completed her cycle. And it's, it's almost like... It's, it's like the, the theme of the butterflies, huh? Like, like the, the theme of the butterflies. Of it, like molting, a larvae molting cocoon, and now it's just the butterfly has gone out. And, and, and the echidna has now turned into a butterfly. She was a cocoon for the longest time, right? In her little seal, right? She was a cocoon for the longest time. And, and now... Out. So, as Omega recounted everything that had happened before she got here, 
There were two things she believed to be worth keeping an eye on in the future. What? One was related to Subaru and the other to Garfield. Okay. We don't exactly know what it is she found to be so interesting about them. But she decided it was best to keep an eye on them as they eventually come to face a person that she could only refer to as him. Him! We gonna fight him! Subaru and Garfield are two very important characters because they're gonna clash against him. And Echidna is keeping a close eye. Or should I say Omega is? Who could him be? I would like to think Regulus. Hector is dead. Or we're, su we're supposed to believe Hector is dead, but nothing in ReZero is a f just a... Everything is assumptions and implications. I'd like to think that it's Hector. Even if she doesn't know Regulus, she does now. <laughs> what do you mean she doesn't know Regulus? Of course she does. Plus a Tomb of Wisdom probably tells... I don't know. There's a, there's a very conflicting thing of like how she doesn't know any of the shit that happened uh, throughout the last 400 years because she sealed away. But she also still has the Tomb of Wisdom, which pretty much means that like she knows all. It's, it's weird, huh? It could refer to the dragon. Yep. Yeah. It, it could refer to the dragon as well. I don't think uh, Flugel is alive anymore. What else could it be? What else could it be? I don't know. There's a lot of candidates. I like the dragon. I like... Uh, I like uh, uh, fucking Regulus. Um, maybe we're thinking too much of just the... Yeah, I like Aldebron. That'd be cool. Reinhardt would be something crazy. I don't think it's Otto, guys. <laughs> I don't think it's Otto, guys. Uh, but let's keep that in mind. There is something close with, like, Garfield and Subaru and how they'll clash against him. And maybe it's as close as Season 3 content during the All Out War, but maybe it's a completely random character that we've also never met yet. In the meantime, though, Omega would journey... Yeah, look at this shit. Look at this shit, right? Echidna. Omega, bro. Omega, bro. She's out! She's done it! How the hell did she do it, bro? ...forward in search of answers to the infinite number of questions that awaited her. To her, this world was nothing more than a treasure trove of knowledge intended to satisfy her limitless greed for it. That's right! She's out! She's finally out! There's so much things that's happened that the last 400 years, what's she gonna do first? So, for the first time in 400 years, a new witch had been released unto the world. The Witch of Omega? No, I don't know how this is... It's still the Witch of Greed. But she goes by Omega now, I guess. This was the true ending to the arc of season two. Yo! But yeah, that's gonna wrap- That's dummy hype. That, and we're gonna watch Echidna's uh, uh, video on this too, but that's dummy hype. Echidna is out. There was, uh, there was like a uh, specific intent on that Ryuzu clone talking with Echidna's voice. There was a hinting at that. <laughs> what does this mean for Roswell then? It means that his, his life- <laughs> Roswell is such a tragedy. Because now he's still after, you know, getting his sensei back. His entire life has just been wasted. 400 fucking years. And, and, and Echidna's out. And she ain't gonna fucking tell Roswell. No way. And Roswell's gonna continue chasing after this elusive goal that he has in his mind. Poor Roswell, man. Things up for our cut content of ReZero's second season. Hopefully you guys enjoyed seeing the broader scope of the entire story. Yes, sir. But now that we're done with this for what's probably going to be a couple of years. Couple of years or another week or so. Guys, give a round of applause for any news. At the end of the day, all I'm doing is just watching other people's videos, right? I'm a lazy ass reactor, but I try my best. And any news has given us such a great comprehensive cut content. Even if you think that there's stuff left out, I appreciate his content, not just ReZero, but many other animes as well. His interest and his niche, right? Aligns perfect with ours, power fantasies, isekai. So thank you so much, Mr. Any News. I salute you for all the contents. Here is the link to his channel. Please. Go like his videos if you haven't. And I will see you guys on whenever we make. There's, there's, there's actually still like, it's like a season three, like summary recap video and stuff like that. But hey, we'll see you there too, okay? Bye-bye.